All right. I know that it's a snow day, as it were, and you didn't expect to have to come to class. But uh, in order to keep us up in terms of our course schedule, not to lose another day, and to be able to move forward in terms of the exam and, and getting your midterm grades in, I felt it important that I uh, do a video lecture, as it were, today, so that you can get a sense of, uh, of, of things going forward in terms of Brazil as we're moving to the very, very end of the colonial period. Um, to begin, I just want to comment ever so briefly in terms of where we are on the course syllabus. So if you take out your syllabus for a moment, you'll see we're coming up to the midterm and so forth. We're at the very, very end, uh, as it were, of this first half of the course. In terms of things, today's lecture is going to really do three things. Uh, we're going to begin with the pictures from the story of the Marquis of Pombal that I shared with you in class last time. Uh, we'll move from there to today's lecture, which you can see for March 3rd is a colony in the age of revolution. And then at the very, very end of class, I want to talk a bit about your midterm exam. Uh, when you give a lecture on a camera, it can be difficult, particularly if you don't have an audience. Uh, I don't know for sure that anybody's watching this, but uh, I hope you do. I hope you take advantage of this, this opportunity. I, do, this, I did decide I did want to bring in an audience as it were to help me in terms of my lecture. Um, I have something of a captive audience, and I'll show them to you right here. And uh, you can see how happy they are to see their father give a lecture on Brazil. All right. Well, let us begin then. We're just going to really jump into things. I want to start out then showing you the images, the pictures that we were using before uh, to describe really the story of the Marquis of Pombal. Briefly review that, and then we'll move forward with today's lecture. So let's begin with the pictures. Okay. Well, these were the pictures, the images that I showed you in class on Friday in terms of the story of the Lisbon earthquake and of the Marquis of Pombal. And this is a typical picture of Lisbon. This is a picture that was done before the earthquake to give you a sense of what things look like. I showed you again this at the very, very beginning of class. And here you have a representation. Uh, this is a, France, a French copper engraving from the second half of the 18th century that you know, dramatically shows the destruction of the city of Lisbon, uh, both by earthquake, by fire, and by tsunami. Well, the man who rebuilt all of this, as we talked about before, was the Marquis of Pombal. You can see him here looking out, as it were, upon his handiwork. He'll go on not only to rebuild Lisbon, but also, as we said, to really transform the Portuguese empire, to transform the relationship in the process between Brazil and Portugal. He understood that Portugal needed Brazil, needed to exploit its colony in order to maintain its prosperity in Europe and so forth. Mentioned briefly in terms of territorial changes that occurred to Brazil during uh, really this period of time, how prior to this you'd had essentially a conflict between the Spanish and the Portuguese over the border. And uh, you can see this is from the Treaty of Tordesillas again of 1494. This is where the border was legally supposed to be from the end really of the, uh, excuse me, the 15th century. Um, the Portuguese of course moved into this area here. We've got Cuiabá, Vila Bela uh, of Mato Grosso way out here. It's all these mining regions. And the Portuguese expanded as we talked about as well into the Amazon, really all the way down here to Colonia do Sacramento and so forth. Ultimately, there's a treaty, 1750. It's the Treaty of Madrid. You can see a reference to it uh, down here in terms of our map. Uh, Pombal is the one who puts the treaty to in fact, uh, to, into effect when he comes into power in 1750. Um, well, returning to Pombal, the story of the earthquake and so forth, you've got all sorts of images uh, in 18th century Europe that purport to show the city being destroyed. And this is a typical example. Again, this is a French engraving from the second half of the 18th century. All sorts of other examples as well. This is an image that was published in Frankfurt in what is today Germany in 1755. And uh, another image here, this is from the Netherlands in 1756. Uh, this is another image, uh, this is one of my favorite images. This is a copper engraving from the Netherlands, late 18th century. Uh, it always strikes me looking at this, uh, the sailor, what does he have to do? Nothing but pray. And you can see him here in the midst of the the grand tsunami and so forth. Well, these are all images in terms of the European imagination that speak to what's going on, uh, the destruction of the city of Lisbon in uh, 1755. Uh, another image here, 
shows what's going on afterwards. And there are several things I'd like to point out looking at this. Among other things, you can see the tents. Uh, people move into tents, not only people, but as I said in class, the royal family as well. You go beyond that, look at what's going on up here, and you can see people being hung. There's a great deal of looting that goes on in the city of Lisbon after all of the chaos, the destruction by fire, by water, uh, by the shaking of the earth. Uh, in fact, in terms of all of this, there were some authorities that believed that the fire had been started by looters. But he, anyway, over here you can see the looters being hung, you can see the priests exhorting them to repentance uh, before their executions and so forth. Another image here shows the city, as it were, being suckered by angels, the survivors uh, being suckered by angels. This is an oil painting from 1760 in Portugal. Well, the next set of images that I'm going to show you in terms of limit, Lisbon are images that were done in the late 1750s. Uh, these are wood and copper engravings and so forth. And they show the destruction in a much more real sort of light. These were done by people that actually visited Lisbon after the destruction was over with, uh, a couple years after, uh, when the city is still in the midst of being rebuilt. And in terms of the passage of time, you can see this image here. This was done in 1757, but it shows that on the ruins you've got, you know, uh, different things growing. It speaks to the fact that these are done somewhat uh, later, as I said. Uh, this is the St. Paul Church, uh, the cathedral that was toppled by the earthquake in 1755. This is where the, the, uh, the anonymous Englishman that I read to you his account at the beginning of class on Friday. This is to where he initially fled and he describes looking out and seeing the entire church toppled uh, with its whole congregation uh, buried in the midst of mass on, on All Saints Day. Uh, just some other images here, another church that's been destroyed, another here, and uh, you know more things being destroyed here. Uh, city of course eventually does get rebuilt uh, this is a significant picture here in terms of one of the buildings that actually semi-survives. This was the Church of Carmel uh, before it was destroyed by the earthquake in the 18th century. Today you can see what remains of it here. And it was kept in this condition as a monument to the earthquake and to its destruction. Um, moving on here you can see the arches that actually survived the quake. And today this is actually a museum. Uh, that's created in, in memory of the quake itself. Uh, big question Europeans have after the destruction of Lisbon is why did this occur? What brought it about? Uh, you've got poems being written, you've got essays being written from everybody, from all sorts of people including for example Voltaire uh, writing about these things. Well this is a British satirical illustration in which you can see on our right hand side the Portuguese king here, Catholic, and on our left, over here, a Protestant British clergyman. And uh, the king asks, he says, Since you are become an advocate for religious liberty, and again, here he's asking this Protestant clergyman, Tell me what I must do to avert the repetition of the divine displeasure. How does the clergyman respond? He says, May it please your majesty to suppress and abolish that infernal tribunal of the Inquisition, and then you may hope for the divine protection and blessing. Uh, the earthquake is used by Protestants and Catholics as they fight over religious doctrines. And here you can see our clergyman, here our Protestant clergyman, showing an auto de fe and the burning of these heretics at the stake. Well, moving on, in terms of our cast of characters and all of this, here is Don Jose. Again, he is the Portuguese king in 1755 when the earthquake strikes. He actually ruled Portugal between 1750 and 1777. I alluded to the fact that he was uh, not a, an especially uh, confident sort of monarch. He's really ultimately the beck and call of his chief minister. And this is particularly the case after the earthquake. Who is the chief minister? Well, as we said, it's the Marquis of Pombal. And here you can see Pombal uh, here. There are many images of Pombal. In terms of other characters that are important in all of this, 
Pombal, among other things, comes from a very large family, from the rural aristocracy, essentially a kind of lower aristocracy. Here you can see Pombal and two, two of his half-brothers. On the left, uh, Father Paulo G. Carvalho e Mendonça. On the right, another of his half-brothers, Francisco Xavier G. Mendonça Furtado. Uh, one of the arguments in terms of Pombal's time in power is that he's essentially using his power uh, to enrich his family and, and, and acquaintances and so forth, including, among others, these two brothers that are both highly placed. Uh, Francisco Xavier de Mendonça Furtado that you see on the right will actually ultimately serve as a fellow minister alongside Pombal uh, during a period of time. These are the two brothers that the poem, uh, the little sonnet that I read to you at the end of class refers to. Uh, moving on, beyond our cast of characters, as it were, here you can see what Isbin, Lisbon looked like uh, before the earthquake. This is Lisbon as it looked roughly 1650, 100 years before the earthquake. Compare that to this, the Lisbon of 1785, after the whole city has been rebuilt. And again, I'm going to go back. This part right here is called the Praça do Comercio today. It was a central kind of plaza where the docks existed. Uh, you can see it here. This was then the center, as it were. Moving forward to the Lisbon afterwards, here you can see that same Plaza do Comercio, the Praça do Comercio. The city looks very, very different. Everything's completely changed uh, following all of this. Well, today in Portugal, Marquia Pombal is very much celebrated. You've got a great monument to him at one of the central roundabouts in Lisbon, uh, the Praça do Marquês de Pombal. This dates originally to 1882, when the monument's first stone was put in place. The present statue was not begun, however, until 1917, not completed until 1934. Uh, again, this is in the center part of Lisbon today. Essentially, Pombal is on the top, and he's looking out upon, again, his handiwork. And here you can see blown up an image. Next to him is a lion. This is a symbol of power and authority and so forth. And then the other parts of the monument speak to different facets of Pombal's time in power, different facets of the Pombaline reforms. Just to highlight, here you can see he's guiding the ship of state, as it were. And then all around this are different elements that speak to the different reforms, the different things that happened over the course of his time in power. Uh, here, you can see agricultural reforms here, but in the forefront, an individual rising up out of the destruction, the chaos of the broken city that's been, uh, been destroyed. On the back side, this is a representation of the University of Coimbra, and this speaks, among other things, to his educational reforms, especially after he kicks the Jesuits out. Then looking out from that statue, you're looking out upon the Baisha, the low part of the city. And this is where essentially he's created a grid. And you can see this as it looks today. Uh, very straight streets. At the time, they were considered very, very large. Today, they're, of course, relatively uh, narrow streets. And another image here, this is looking out from the, the castle of St. George down upon the same part of the city. Well, as we said, Pombal transforms Portugal. He does more than that. He transforms its relationship to Brazil. And I alluded to the fact in class, talked about briefly the fact that he is interested in changing its relationship between Portugal and Brazil. He's also interested in exploiting portions of Brazil that have traditionally been considered peripheral. And an example of this is the manner in which the Amazon, and you can see the Amazon here on the map, uh, becomes an important part of, of his plans. In terms of this, he sends his brother, this is Francisco Xavier de Mendonça Furtado, I showed you an image of him earlier, sends his brother, his half-brother really, to serve as the governor general of the Amazon in the 1750s. And it's his brother, among other things, that's sending back reports to Pombal about what's going on in Brazil, particularly in relation to the Treaty of Madrid, particularly in relation to the role that the Jesuit missionaries have with the Indians in, in, in the Amazon region of Brazil. And one could argue that it's the letters from this individual, from his half-brother, that really turn Pombal on the Jesuits. Well, in terms of the Amazon, its resources and so forth, this is an image that they would have never seen from the day, but this is an image, an aerial view of what the Amazon looks like.
I love a description that's given by an author that dealt with the Amazon. Lynn Smith says, The great river is always uncertain of its course, and itself describes fantastic shapes. Sending out feelers in every direction, it spreads its influence over an area almost boundless dimensions. Um, this is the Amazon that he's interested in exploiting. Uh, here you can see it from the air, an aerial view. This is an even more beautiful, spectacular view. This is a satellite image of the Rio Negro and the Rio Solimões as they come together right here in the middle. This is the Black River, the Rio Negro. Here you have the Solimões. They come together to form the great Amazon River, uh, racing, as it were, out to the Atlantic. And if you look, one of the most interesting things of this, in terms of the volume of water that we're talking about, you can even see it in terms of a satellite. The Solimões is a muddy brown river. The Rio Negro is black. When the two come together, you have such volume of water that they separate. They stay separated for like 15 for 20 miles. And you can see it here on the satellite image. You not only see it in the satellite, but if you go to this very spot, they call it in Brazil the wedding of the waters. You can see the two rivers maintaining their separate courses, again, for like 15 for 20 miles. Um, this is where uh, Pombal's brother served as governor general. You can go to the Amazon today. It's spectacular, huge resource in terms of water, variations of plants and animals, and on and on and on. Well, again, this is the story of the Marquis of Pombal and really the manner in which his reforms transformed the relationship between Brazil and Portugal over the 18th century. Um, in terms of thinking of all of this in a, in a bigger picture, a picture that really leads us into today's lecture, Pombal, and again seated here you can see him, Pombal understood that he could remake the relationship between Portugal and Brazil, that he could remake all sorts of things, that he could essentially draw upon Enlightenment ideas to change the Portuguese Empire. And yet a lot of ways you could say that the manner in which he draws upon these ideas, reinforcing the power of the state in his case, is contradictory in some ways in terms of the Enlightenment and perhaps self-defeating. Uh, the Enlightenment is about change. It's about new ideas. It's about, among other things, changing the population of the world in terms of what they think and the way they look at the world. Pombal uses these radical enlightenment sorts of ideas, however, not to give power to the people at all, but rather to give power to the state. And we'll talk about that more uh, right now. All right, well, let's move on then uh, with today's lecture in, in terms of Brazil during the second half, really, of the 18th century and all of the changes that are occurring, as I called today's lecture, a colony in the age of revolution. Uh, to begin, 18th century is a time known as the Enlightenment. It is a time of great social, political, and economic change. Again, we refer to this often as the Enlightenment. In terms of these changes, uh, by way of review, returning to the story of Pombal, you have the transformation really of the, the Portuguese Empire in terms of its political uh, system by Pombal during this era. Uh, among other things, a shift from conciliar to ministerial government as we talked about last time. Shifts within colonial administration. Uh, attempts in this respect to develop the Amazon region of Brazil. The colonial shift in terms of the capital, so the capital shifts from Bahia to Rio de Janeiro. And also, of course, the decline in gold production during this period will mean that the crown uh, begins to clamp down on the collection of the royal fifths, eventually instituting a head tax that will have ramifications in Brazil that we'll talk about in greater detail today. These are all some of, again, really the transformations that occur under Pombal. You can think of them in terms of the Portuguese Empire, again, as part of the Enlightenment. In terms of other Pombaline reforms, the Jesuits are kicked out of Brazil. They're kicked out of the rest of the Portuguese Empire. They had been accused of Pombal, by Pombal of creating an autonomous state really within a state, as it were, in the Amazon and in other parts of Brazil. Really, it's a church-state conflict that you're talking about here. Pombal has them uh, kicked out. Beyond this, we didn't mention it before, but there are agricultural and industrial reforms, really, that occur in Portugal. The formation of a wine monopoly company, for example, in Porto. And also, you've got educational reforms uh, in terms of this as well. In Coimbra, the Jesuits are no longer in control. You've got new ideas and techniques and methods and so forth that really begin to filter into Portugal 
to a lesser extent into Brazil during the second half of the 18th century. And again, that sets us up then for really today's lecture. Now, how do you do a lecture when I don't have a chalkboard and a list of terms? Let me show you the list of terms right now that we're going to be using uh, over the course of the day, uh, today's lecture. And then beyond that, uh, I'll probably bring them in on the video as we're moving along as well. Okay, and here you can see the list of terms here for today's lecture. There's a number of them you can see. I'm going to pause so that you can write them down. Additionally, as I indicated, as I go over these terms in the lecture, uh, I'll make it so that they appear at the bottom of the screen uh, for, I don't know, five to ten seconds so that you can, can see them written as I'm going along as well. All right, so returning to uh, our lecture. To begin, the Enlightenment in Brazil during the second half of the 18th century. Well, the Enlightenment in Brazil was in the first instance a time of exploration. Uh, and a really good example of this, personified in an individual, is the story of the uh, Portuguese naturalist Alexandre Rodrigues Ferreira, who sailed down the Amazon in the period between 1783 and 1793. He was accompanied by artists and painters, uh, who made extensive illustrations of the region's plants and animals and indigenous peoples and so forth. Uh, and they didn't just do illustrations, they also gathered specimens, they shipped these specimens back to Lisbon, they gathered geographical information also that was useful to the Portuguese crown as it was attempting to, to establish really and defend the borders of Portuguese America in relation to Spanish America as well. And so among other things, this naturalist from the 18th century, Alexandre Rodriguez Ferreira, could be thought of as well as a Portuguese spy in the uh, midst of the Amazon in the middle of the 18th century. I should say the end of the 18th century, 1783 to 1793. And then again, in, in terms of the region that he's looking at, again, it's the Amazon. Let me show it to you here on, on the map. All right, here you can see a map of Brazil. The naturalist, Alexandre Rodriguez Ferreira, he's journeying really up and down the Amazon. And you see part of the Amazon here in this image of Brazil. Perhaps a better picture uh, would be from this other map here that shows you um, how deep you can go on this river system into the interior of Brazil. And it's all the way out into this area here that he's journeying as well. And uh, again, it gives you a sense of the scope of all of this. And of course, here you're on the very edge again with Spanish America, it, among other things. He's a naturalist, but he's also a spy. I'll show you some images of this uh, in class again next time. Beyond the Enlightenment being about exploration in terms of Brazil, it's also about ideas and the influence that these ideas have in society. Throughout Europe, you've got the formation during this period of time of various uh, improvement, reform societies. Uh, really, over the course of the 18th century, you have the same sort of thing uh, occurring to a limited extent in Brazil as well. Generally, these societies are literary in nature. Now, I'm going to essentially give you a list of four different societies then that are formed in Brazil during really the course of the 18th century. We'll talk about where they are, when they exist, what they're doing. And at the end, I want to talk about you know the big picture. What is the importance, as it were? What can we learn from their existence? But to begin, we have the Academia Brasilica dos Esquecidos. It is formed in Salvador de Bahia, the old colonial capital, in 1724 and 1725. And again, this is when Bahia is still the capital of Brazil. Uh, if we go to our map, we can see what Bahia looks like right here. And here you can see, again, another map of Brazil. Uh, this can be used to you know, speak to various locations. Here, I just want to highlight Salvador de Bahia, the old colonial capital. This is where the Academia Brasilica dos Esquecidos is formed. Again, this is 1724-1725. And uh, picking up, the purpose of the Academy of Brasilica dos Escasidos, his purpose was to gather information really about the political and the natural history of Brazil, to send it to Lisbon, to be included with a much larger history of Portugal, really of the Portuguese Empire, that was being composed there by the Royal Academy of History. Uh, one of this society's members was a man by the name of Sebastião 
the Hosha Pita. Uh, he was a native of Bahia, subsequently published really a monumental history of Portuguese America in Lisbon in uh, 1730. It was called, uh, I'll translate it for you here, A History of Portuguese America from the year 1500, uh, the year of its discovery, until uh, 1724. Well, the work was celebrated in Portugal. Rocha Pita, its author, was subsequently made a noble of the royal house. He was made a member of the Order of Christ and so forth. Um, this is a big deal to have somebody from Brazil that gets these honors. And yet, significantly, the society only existed uh, really for a year. It was disbanded in 1725, the year after it was formed. A second society was called the Academia dos Selectos, the Academy of the Select. It was formed in Rio de Janeiro in 1751. It only meets one time before it's disbanded. Uh, thereafter, eight years later really, you have the formation of the Academia Brasilica dos Renascidos, the Brazilian Academy of the Reborn. Uh, it's formed in Salvador da Bahia in 1759. It will meet 15 different times before it will be disbanded in 1760 by the Governor General. And then finally you have the Sociedade Literaria, uh, the Literary Society. It was formed in Rio de Janeiro. It exists really between 1786 and 1790. It's reformed again briefly in 1794. Among other things, it is disbanded. Why? Because of what was conceived at the time as political radicalism. And returning once again to Rio de Janeiro, uh, this is where the Sociedade Literaria is formed. It exists between 1786 and 1790, again briefly in 1794, before it's eventually disbanded. Well, what's the big picture? You've got a series of different literary societies that are formed over the course of the 18th century, improvement societies, reform societies. They only exist for a small period of time. Why? Well, the societies were frequently disbanded. They don't flourish in Brazil, among other things, because of the way the Enlightenment functions uh, in the Portuguese world. The Enlightenment in Portugal was filtered through the powers of the church and through the power of the state. Reforms then were meant uh, not, as it were, to enlighten the populace, but rather to reinforce the powers that be. And, of course, the Pombolin reforms are a really, really good example of this. Uh, beyond this, beyond the powers of the church and the state, and the manner in which the Enlightenment is filtered through these powers, in the case of Brazil, you've got another issue to deal with as well. And that is the fact that the Enlightenment is being filtered through the lens of a slave society. In Brazil, there is always the issue, the contradiction really of slavery, an institution that very much mediated and transformed the way the Enlightenment is conceived. Uh, the contradictions in this respect of the Enlightenment in Luso-Brazilian society are perhaps best personified in the life of an individual that I want to talk about in a bit of detail. His full name was José Joaquín da Cunha Azeredo Cochinho. Uh, I will refer to him here on out as simply Azeredo Cochinho. If you saw him on an exam, that's how he would appear. He was a Luso-Brazilian intellectual of the period. In terms of background, Azarevo Cochino was born in Rio de Janeiro in 1742. In 1768, relatively young age of 25, he would manage various plantations that were owned by his family in Brazil. And this speaks to the fact that he comes from elite society. He comes from a society of plantation owners, really, a family of plantation owners. They own a lot of slaves. They've got a bunch of plantations. At the young age of 25, he's managing uh, these plantations. Well, he'll subsequently enroll at the University of Coimbra in the 1770s, and he'll begin to publish extensively thereafter. He wrote a great deal about sugar production. Uh, and again, he comes from a plantation family. He, he managed plantations. He knows all about making sugar. Uh, among other things, he asserted in the 1770s that Brazil could step in to fill the gap caused by upheaval in the Caribbean during this period of time. He advocated for free trade. In this respect, it's apparent that he'd read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. In terms of free trade, it should be emphasized at this point that Brazil is not allowed to trade with anybody else, 
except Portugal. This is a mercantile system. Portugal, uh, as it were, owns Brazil. Brazil is Portugal's colony. Any trade between Brazil and anywhere else really in the world, theoretically, notwithstanding, of course, smuggling that goes on, but theoretically is all supposed to go through Portugal. He advocates, as it were, for opening Brazil's ports to the world for trade. Um, give you a sense of his ideas in this respect. I just want to read to you a little snippet of what he wrote from one of his essays. This was an essay, an economic essay that he wrote. He writes, if Portugal preserves an adequate navy and merchant marine, if satisfied with her vast dominions in the four quarters of the globe, she renounces further conquests. If she promotes by every possible means the development of riches which her possessions have the capacity to produce, if she maintains her vassals in peace and tranquility and assures their right to enjoy the fruits of their estates, if she establishes manufactures only of the most indispensable necessities and abandons those of luxury to foreigners in order to allow them an opportunity to purchase her superfluities, no enemy will molest her or disturb her her quiet. Essentially he's saying we need to understand what our resources are, we need to use them efficiently, and let's not bring in all sorts of grand ambitious ideas that are essentially going to bankrupt, as it were, the Portuguese Empire. So economics is a huge part of his uh, ideas. Among other things in terms of economics, more specifically in terms of the Enlightenment, he uses progressive ideas to reinforce the plantation class into which he had been born in Brazil. An example of this, 1798, he publishes a defense of the slave trade. Uh, among other things, he had very little patience for liberalism. He didn't like Rousseau, he doesn't like Voltaire, and so forth. He's using his pen to defend the monarchy and to, to defend the church. Essentially, in this respect, in terms of slavery, in terms of the slave trade, He's twisting Enlightenment ideas to defend slavery as a defense of property. Well, what happens to him? He graduates from Coimbra, and again, he goes there in the 1770s, graduates from Coimbra, uh, becomes a priest. Eventually, he serves as a bishop in both Elvis, which is a small little town, a city now in Portugal, on the very edge of Portugal with, with, with the Spanish border, and he also serves as a bishop in Brazil in Pernambuco in the northeast of Brazil. And I can show you that here uh, on the map. Well, today he's sometimes seen, returning to Azuré de Cochinho again, as a proto-nationalist uh, because among other things, because of his advocacy for free trade. And yet, given the conservative nature of his ideas, given his loyalty to Portugal, this is a, a very debatable sort of thing to say he's, as it were, the first Brazilian nationalist for an independent Brazil, as it were. And he's very, very loyal to Portugal. Well, in sum, what does he personify? Azuré do Coutinho personifies really the contradictions of Enlightenment ideas in a slave society. Well, notwithstanding this fact, notwithstanding really the conservative nature of the Enlightenment in Brazil, uh, Enlightenment ideas, the ideas that are coming into Brazil, did make people very much aware that their interests were different than those in, of, of the Portuguese in Portugal, as it were. Brazilian elites come to realize over the course of the 18th century that their interests are different than the interest of, of the crown of others in Portugal. Pombolin reforms, attempts by the crown to reassert itself in Brazil over the course of the 18th century, among other things, with heavy taxes to make up for the decline in gold production during this period, will very much contribute to this perception. Beyond this, the colonists themselves in Brazil begin in the late 18th century to have models that they can draw upon in terms of change, including after 1776, the American Revolution. It's factors such as these, change in other parts of the Atlantic, in the United States more specifically, that will lead really to a number of uprisings in Brazil at the end of the 18th century. And I want to conclude in terms of the main body of this lecture, giving you two examples of two specific uprisings that occur in Brazil in the late 18th century. Uh, the first is very much modeled on the American Revolution. Uh, 
In Minas Gerais, in the interior of Brazil, the first really gold producing region of Brazil that we talked about during the golden age of Brazil. In Minas Gerais, in the capital of, of this province, Ouro Preto, uh, in the late 1780s, you have a conspiracy that's formed. It is called in Portuguese, the Inconfidencia Mineira. In, in English, the translation would roughly be the Minas Conspiracy. Let me show it to you here on the map so you know first off where we're talking about. And, uh, and uh, here you can see this is the Minas Gerais region of Brazil. Ouro Preto is ground zero for the Minas Conspiracy right there. Well, what is this conspiracy? It is led in part by an individual who had the nickname of Chiridenches. Literally, this means tooth puller. His full name was Joaquim José da Silva Xavier. They called him Chiridenches, tooth puller. Uh, he was a dragoon, a dragoon corporal, a dentist, as it, and a dentist on the side. And this is where we get the term Chiridenches from. Uh, he is one of the leaders in terms of this conspiracy. The reality is there are a variety of other elites and or intellectuals in Ouro Preto that were very much part of this as well. Well, 1788, they develop a plan to rebel from the Portuguese crown, to declare independence, to establish an independent Portuguese republic in the middle of Brazil, modeled after the United States. Among other things, what are their motivations? Well, they're particularly concerned because of a head tax that the local governor had recently imposed upon the region. And again, uh, your taxes from, from gold are going down as gold declines during the second half of the 18th century. How does the crown make that up? Well, you change your tax system. And this, of course, leads to trouble in terms of the elites in Brazil who are having to pay these taxes. So, what do they do? Well, they develop a plan, as I said, to rebel, to declare independence, to establish a republic modeled, as it were, on an independent United States. Some of the leaders wanted to abolish slavery, others did not. And again, this leads us to the larger question of the uh, contradictions of slavery in, uh, in, in a slave-based society when you're dealing with the Enlightenment. Why do some want to abolish slavery? Why do others not? Well, in terms of abolishing slavery, there was real fear as they're planning their conspiracy that the government might arm the slaves and send them to put their rebellion down. And so there's this fear. The slaves, of course, will be armed. They'll be promised their freedom by the government. Maybe we should promise them their freedom first. Well, others, of course, don't like this idea at all. Again, you're in a slave society with plantation owners and a social hierarchy and so forth. Eventually, they compromise. The leaders agree that natural-born slaves in Brazil will be free. African-born slaves will remain in servitude. In terms of this, it's obvious that their notions of liberty and independence are very, very conservative. Their rebellion significantly is planned in 1788. This is before the French Revolution. It's really modeled again upon the story of revolution, as it were, in the United States. They want to change the political structure. They want to do so, however, without social upheaval. Uh, they want to remain, as it were, at the top of this social hierarchy. Well, this is their plan, this is their conspiracy. The reality is that it never gets off the ground. Uh, news of their plans are leaked uh, to the local governor who will arrest all of the conspirators on March 15th, 1789. The government will convict most of the plotters It will send them into exile and imprisonment in Angola across the Atlantic. They're sent off to Africa. Only Chiridenches, that I mentioned at the beginning of class, only Chiridenches will pay with his life. In 1792, he will be hung and thereafter drawn and quartered in Rio de Janeiro. Essentially, uh, his body parts are used as an example of what happens if you put yourself up against the Portuguese uh, crown. Well, beyond the story of the Inconfidencia Minera, what happens afterwards can again speak very much to the manner in which you've got contradictions of the Enlightenment in a slave-based society. While the plotters, 
who are part of this conspiracy in Minas, while they're being tried, while they're being convicted, what happens in Europe? The French Revolution happens in Europe. Uh, the French Revolution is a very different kind of revolution than the American Revolution uh, that they were modeling everything they wanted to do. Uh, the French Revolution is about a king losing his head. Maybe they'd be fine with that. Who knows? It's about the aristocracy losing their heads. And then, of course, it begins to consume itself. And lots of people are losing their heads, as it were. The social structure is completely changing. Everything's upside down. It's topsy-turvy. Suddenly, you have a different model, as it were, of revolution. Well, Brazilians see this different model. Elite Brazilians see this model. Suddenly, they don't want anything to do with change. And this is further reinforced in 1791 when the Haitian Revolution breaks out uh, in the Caribbean. Haiti was a French colony. It was Saint-Domingue at the time. 1791 is the beginning of the uprising. It'll go on for a decade and a half. Eight, by 1804, Haiti has established itself as an independent black republic in the Caribbean and of course the white French planters and so forth that were in Haiti they've lost their heads they've had to flee suddenly you've got another model a model of people playing with revolutionary ideas as in the case of elites in San Domingue and suddenly it's spreading as it were to the slaves and you've got social uh, chaos as it were the hierarchy is turned upon its head and and masters are dead well it's because of things like this that suddenly thereafter, really after this uh, in 1789, the Minas Conspiracy, elites in Brazil don't want anything at all to do with political reform. Uh, they're terrified, they're afraid that what happened in Haiti, what happened in France could happen in Brazil. And, uh, and they don't want anything to do with reform, as it were. This is further reinforced, in turn, by another uprising, the second of the two I want to speak about, that occurs in the northeast of Brazil, in the old colonial capital of Bahia in 1798. Uh, it is called the Taylor's Revolt. And again, if we go to our map here, you can get a sense of where we're talking about. Bahia in the northeast. And here... Salvador de Bahia, ground zero for the Taylor's Revolt. Uh, in terms of the revolt itself, it was an uprising among poor artisans and others who want to follow a French pattern of social revolution. Uh, their followers include both women and also slaves. The leader of the revolt was a man by the name of João de Deus, John of God. Uh, he was a mulatto and he was a tailor, and it is in part uh, from his occupation and those of many of his fellow conspirators that we get the term Taylor's Revolt today. Again, he's a 27-year-old mulatto tailor, João Judeus. Well, what do they want to do with this revolution? They want to do away with slavery. Among other things, this cut them off from the planters, from the wealthy elite in Brazil, including even those who had liberal sympathies. And uh, the revolt itself is very, very quickly put down. In terms of uh, how this cuts them off from the elites, I just want to read to you from the actual trial of João Gideus. I've got a copy here somewhere of a little snippet from his trial. Uh, where someone is testifying what João Gideus was proclaiming through the streets before he's captured by the Portuguese dragoons. Uh, listen to this. He's saying, quote, All Brazilians would become Frenchmen in order to live in equality and abundance. They would destroy the public officials, attack the monasteries, open the port, and reduce all to an entire revolution so that all might be rich and taken out of poverty and that the differences between white, black, and brown would be extinguished, and that all without discrimination would be admitted to positions and occupations. Uh, everybody gets a job, as it were, and no more racial discrimination. Uh, this was very radical. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't gain any sympathy on the part of elites at all. It is very, very quickly uh, put down, as I said. So the Taylor's Revolt, 1798 uh, in Bahia. The rebellion is put down. João Gideus himself is hung. He's executed in 1799. Uh, anyway, again, the Enlightenment, as it were, filtered through 
a slave-based society. Well, I've got a bunch of pictures for this lecture, but I want to show them at the beginning of the next class, uh, more than anything, so that you can ask me questions and we can have some exchange that you can't at all in terms of a video. But I do want to come back to the larger significance of all of this. What are we to make of this? Well, what are our conclusions? You've got a great deal of social and political tension that's really existing in Brazil, that exists in Brazilian society during this period of time. And various segments of the region's population have very real political and social grievances. You see that with the Minas Conspiracy. You see that with the Taylor's Revolt and so forth. And yet, the responses of elites would ultimately be limited by questions of both slavery and race. And yet, these same Brazilian-born elites are also beginning to recognize that their interests were in many ways fundamentally different than their counterparts in Lisbon. The survival of Portugal depended, at, by this point in time, almost entirely upon Brazil. Brazil had become far more powerful, more important than the mother country herself, as it were. And this is recognized, of course, by these elites in Brazil with the passage of time, but it's also even recognized by the crown, by the crown's counselors in Lisbon. And we see this really early on in the 18th century. I want to give you the case in conclusion of a man by the name of Antonio Rodrigues da Costa. He was a gifted linguist. He was a founding member of the Royal Academy of History in Lisbon. He was called to serve on the Overseas Council at the beginning of the 18th century, served for a lengthy period of time. Well, shortly before his death, in 1732, he wrote a letter to the Portuguese crown, warning, in the midst of Brazil's golden age, warning that the heavy taxes being levied on the colony would eventually drive its inhabitants, the inhabitants of Brazil, to rid themselves, really, of Portugal altogether. Listen to what he says. He says, It is obvious that if Brazil is placed in one scale of the balance and Portugal in the other, the former will weigh far more heavily than the latter, and consequently, the larger and richer will not consent to be ruled by the smaller and the poorer. Well, by the end of the 18th century, it would appear that Brazil, as it were, was well on its way to independence. Yet in such times, fate, as it were, has a way of stepping in, really of mixing things up a bit, and this is exactly the case uh, here. November 1807, the French Emperor Napoleon, intent on European domination, sent French troops through Spain to invade Portugal. In response, the royal family packs really everything up and they flee. And the story of where they flee and the consequences that this will have upon Brazil, upon Portugal, and the relationship between the two is what we'll deal with in class on Wednesday. All right, well, uh, that gives you a preview in terms of next time. I'm going to show you pictures, as I said, next time to give you a sense of uh, really what we've talked about in terms of today. I want to spend one last moment, about five minutes or so, talking briefly to the class as a whole about your upcoming exam, which is scheduled uh, again for next, uh, next Monday. Okay, I want to say a few words about your exam. And to begin, I just want to give you a sense of the format of the exam. Uh, what follows right here is a sample exam that I gave to a completely different class. It was a history of Mexico, set up similarly to your history of Brazil. Um, but this is the format of what your exam would look like, but of course with different information, different material. You can see there's two parts. The first part up here are the IDs. Uh, the IDs are worth 32 points total. Uh, that is to say, you have nine IDs to choose from, and you need to choose four of the nine. Uh, each one of those four being worth eight points, eight times four is 32. So you can see it here. Again, this was a history of Mexico course, so none of these IDs would look similar. It will look familiar to you in this course. Uh, your IDs, uh, for their part, will be drawn from the review sheet. Uh, that I mentioned in my email that's posted on the course website that I included as an attachment in the email that I sent out. And I'll go to that review sheet in a, in a moment and speak more about that. Uh, the second 
portion of the exam. You can see here is an essay portion. It says do one of the following. You'll get your choice of two essay questions and uh, you need to choose one of the two and uh, give me a good solid essay. Generally two and a half to three pages is what students, a good essay typically includes in terms of length. Um, you can see this is worth 68 points, approximately two-thirds of the exam. And you can see the instructions indicate write a well-structured essay using specific evidence and examples drawn from both lectures and readings in response to one of the following questions. And then there will be two broad uh, questions ask you for big picture sort of information um, and then you want to respond uh, providing a you know big picture view of things but then using evidence from specific lectures detailed evidence uh, to back up what you want to argue um, so anyway that gives you a sense in terms of of the format of it in terms of uh, just a couple of other things very quickly in all of this as I said that your choice of the nine IDs will be drawn from the midterm study guide. And here I've blown up an example of the midterm study guide. You can see there are a lot of terms here. Nine of these terms uh, will end up on the exam. And then you'll ultimately choose four of the nine in your response. A uh, big question in all of this is how do you deal with so many terms? Well, I'd encourage you, among other things, to start now. We're a week away from the exam. These IDs are the building blocks, both for the ID section, but ultimately the details that you could draw upon in an essay. And so start now. There's a lot of material to learn, but start now. You've got a week. Secondly, group these terms together. So for example, if you look here, you'll see that the terms basically go in the order of any given lecture. So our first day in class, we dealt with these terms, Feitoria, Madeira, Vasco da Gama, Goa. The next class took us right down essentially uh, through here and, uh, and on and on. Group them together. Uh, any given ID is going to have different details, but the big picture in terms of the ID is going to be very similar to the terms next to it. And so even though you've got, you know, I don't know, 90 or 100 of these terms, the reality is, is that they come from 13, 14, 15 lectures and discussions. So you're dealing with much less here uh, in, in terms of that. So don't let it overwhelm you. Think of what is the big picture in terms of any given, any given lecture. Uh, moving on from that, I just want to give you a sense of what a good ID looks like. And for that, I actually want to use one of the terms from today's lecture. This is an actual example from an exam of how a student responded to the ID Chiridensis. And here, this is an excellent example. You can see I've written it's historically accurate, it's comprehensive, it's detailed, it's specific. The student gets a full eight points for this. Uh, just to read over it quickly, they write, Chiridenchis was a Portuguese dentist and dragoon corporal who led the Inconfidencia Minera, which involved in part of the Minas Gerais region of Brazil in 1788. This rebellion, though it admittedly never got off the ground, was planned before the French Revolution and was instead modeled after the American Revolution. He supported a political, not social, revolution with the primary concern being taxation charges. He wanted to free natural-born slaves but continue African slavery. The revolt was put down in March of 1789 and all the rebels were sent to prison in Angola, except Chiridenchis. He was hung and then quartered in 1792 as an example to others considering a rebellion. Again, it's, it, it, it's accurate, it's comprehensive, it's detailed. You want to write essentially a good solid paragraph for any given ID. And this was a very, very good example. Now, here's another example. It was also a good example. It's fairly comprehensive and specific. It does leave out a key detail, or rather it gets it wrong. It doesn't get the location right. So they would have gotten six or seven points instead of the full eight points. You can see here, Chiridenchis, the tooth puller, was an uneducated dentist who led a revolt in Bahia in Salvador in the 1780s. Well, they just got the location wrong. His revolt was unsuccessful and the leaders were rounded up, but only Chiridenchis was killed. In fact, he was drawn and quartered. Chiridenchis, like Miguel Giudalgo, became a symbol of the spirit of independence for his country and is yet another example of people in Latin America identifying themselves more as Americans, Brazilian, Mexican, etc., rather than European. Again, this is a good example. They just messed up the location. Uh, this, on the other hand, is a poor example. It says Chiridenchis is the nickname, meaning tooth puller or dentist. Well, that's literally correct. 
He was known as one of the meanest people in all of Spain in the late 1500. He led a revolt which never really had any impact. It ended really before it started. He did not like taxes or local powers. Who does? Every person was executed in the revolt. However, Chiridanchis was exiled to Angola. He was a warning for other people who were believing to lead a revolt. Well, you can see they try to be comprehensive, but many of the details are vague and are incorrect. Uh, though they do, again, get the meaning of the name correct. You get the sense that the student recognizes the name, they just can't put it really in any sort of accurate kind of context. And then finally, another very poor example, much poorer than that one, is here where you have a student who's historically in inaccurate, it's not comprehensive, it's not detailed, though again they get the meaning of the name correct. They might get one point for this. Literally the dentist. This was the nickname for a Brazilian aristocrat. So that is to give you a sense, as it were, of what my expectations are on the IDs. We'll talk more about the essays in the review session on Tuesday. We'll also talk about the essays when we move forward, uh, ideally, class on Friday for a little bit as part of our, our reading that we'll do on that day. But one other comment in terms of keeping track of all of this, uh, the essay did ask you to draw, you can see, upon both lectures and reading. Uh, to facilitate that, what I will provide in terms of drawing here, as it says, upon both lectures and reading, is a list of all of the readings that we've done uh, to date over the course of the semester so that when you're actually writing your essay, you can, uh, you're not trying to pluck that out of the air, as it were, but you can say, oh, I remember we read somebody that dealt with that. You can look down the list, you can recognize the name, and then you can include uh, you know, a reference to the reading and what it taught, what it showed, uh, as you're making an argument in your essay. So anyway, again, here you've got an example of what the exam would look like in terms of format. In terms of the IDs, you want to do the who, the what, the where, the when, and then the most important thing, the thing you're going to really spend time crafting on the ID is, is you know, the larger significance. How does any given term fit into the larger arguments of any given lecture? But again, thank you very much for, for, for listening. I know it was a, a maybe a way you didn't want to spend a, a snow day. Um, my children, on the other hand, they didn't have much choice in the matter. Uh, it's fun to have a captive audience. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Let's try one more time. <laughs>